Hello. Um, I had the ambition to give this in Czech, which is my mother tongue. But then I realized that I will be talking about endless forms, most beautiful. And then I checked how is it translated. And I realized this would be a disaster. So I apologize for speaking English. If you don't understand a word of what I'm saying, be assured there will be a lot of images and videos for you to enjoy. Because what I would like to convince you about is that life is absolutely amazing at creating shapes and form. I'm demonstrating this here on the three realms of life, on animals, on the fungi and the plants. And the question is, how does life do that? Of course, life is made of cells. Cells are the units of life. Everything in life is made of cells. We are ma made of cells. And it is the ability of cells to coordinate their, 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 their behavior to create shapes, which, is, which we refer to as a process of morphogenesis. This is a very important word. I will repeat it many times, so remember it, morphogenesis. Especially us, animals. We are very good at morphogenesis. And I would like to demonstrate that here on a crustacean, on a shrimp. This uh, animal has on every segment of its body a specialized appendage. This appendage has a specific function. Some of it is used for briefing, some for swimming, some for eating. And the function associates with different form, different shape. So how does this arise? Of course, it arises during a process of development. And we have now the technology to see it, to see it in its end entirety, which we'll be seeing now here is the compression of the embryonic development of this creature in a couple of seconds, which normally takes four and a half days. We will see every single cell. As I start to play it, we will see how these cells are dividing. We have more and more cells. At some point, we start seeing a little bumps, which are the forming appendages. And as we zoom in, we see the spectacle of morphogenesis unfurl in front of our eyes. The cells are moving past each other, they are dividing, they are ma migrating, they are creating the shape and form of these appendages. So the next question which I will ask is how did life acquire this amazing ability to create shape and form? Of course, like many answers in biology, the answer is through evolution. We understand a lot about, multi about how multicellular life arose from unicellular one, because believe it or not, this happened many times. We also now have a very good catalog of how cells can change shape and create form. However, despite the fact that we understand the origin of all animals, we do not understand very well how do these processes evolve. In other words, we do not understand the phylogeny of morphogenesis. And we need to understand it. If we, if we define morphogenesis as the coordination of cell behavior to create shape, we don't know and we need to know how many ways there are for cells to change their shape and coordinate it among themselves. And we need to know and don't know when and how many times did these organisms evolve. In a nutshell, the argument I'm making is that in order to understand life, its origin and its current uh, diversity, we not only need to understand the, the genes and genomes, we need to also understand how genes and genome make cells behave in a way that they create form collectively. Now, the question you might ask, why is now a good time to study such an abstract process such as morphogenesis? Well, this diversity of animal form has evolved by optimizing through ev evolution to a certain environment. And this environment is now dramatically changing. It has been argued that we are living in the sixth extinction of the geological time. The last one happened when dinosaurs were ru ruling the earth and what happened to them. So what one f forgets is that extinction doesn't only mean that the adult form of the animal di disappears. It also means that sometimes the reason why animals get extinct is because their embryos cannot develop. And therefore, it is very important to study how embryonic processes interact with the changing environment to somehow counteract this catastrophe which is be be befalling our planet. Another question you might ask yourself, what should we as humans care about something as abstract as morphogenesis? Well, maybe some of us, maybe somebody we, we, we know, maybe our loved ones are suffering from some kind of error of uh, 
are some kind of developmental errors such as spina bifida. This is actually quite common. One in thousand births are affected by it. In its milder form, you can actually lead a normal life, but you will carry the consequences of this event throughout your, your life. I actually know something about it from personal experience. This is very much a morphogenetic disease. It is the f failure to close the neurotube and so understanding you know, whether this is something ancient and we have no chance to change it, or whether this is a human-specific adaptation and we can perhaps do something about it. And the final reason which I want to talk about is the, that we need to really acquire a full picture of, of, of life. You will now hear a lot about sequencing the planet. Everything is about sequencing, about genes and genome, about the, about the information. But me and, and my colleagues, we, we argue that we also need to understand the cells and processes. And so the program to study evolution of morphogenesis and shaping of life is very important. Now, what do we know at this point how morphogenesis works? There is a decades of research which paint a picture which tells us that essentially in the embryo, some specific molecules, which are regulators, they single out some grou groups of cells. They by themselves cannot do anything, but they can affect effectors, they can affect proteins, which can make the cells change their shapes. And if this is co coordinated across many cells, you get a formation of shapes such as e invagination. Now, this kind of work, this kind of knowledge we gain from studying these beautiful creatures, which are our model organisms, which are very powerful. We have a lot of tools to study them, to dissect them, to understand them very much. However, they are giving us a very limited picture of the diversity of the formation of shape. They are not making use of the tree of life. And the tree of life is the most important thing in biology. biology is not such exact discipline such as mathematics or physics. It is more about opinions. But if there is something which we can trust in biology, then it is the tree of life. This is the ground rock. This is the ground truth which we can rely on. Many areas of, 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 of biology have been making great advantages, great advances using the tree, 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 tree of life to make inference, to make discoveries. And so now I, I argue that we, there is a time to also look at the formation of shape, morphogenesis across the phylogeny. In order to do that, we have to expand our repertoire of the animals we work with and work also with these species, which may not look so beautiful and which may also not look so fundable to do research on them. But this is important to understand the diversity of shape and form. What will we gain? This is one example which is maybe a little bit technical, but I like to do it because it leads me to the you know, final, let's say, straight of my talk, which is if we compare two groups of two groups of species, animals and its sisters, choanoflagellates, this is a group of species which are not animals, but they are closest related to animals. It was recently discovered that these choanoflagellates, they sometimes make colonies of multiple cells, and these can bend like this or, or like this. They do this in response to light. When they are bent like this, they feed, and when they are bent like this, they swim away. Animals do something very similar. They bend the group of cells here, but they do it for different reasons. They do it to get these cells inside the embryo, and they do it upon cues which come from signaling uh, mo mo molecules and other cues. Also, the red stuff, which is highlighted here, the molecular machinery, how it works, is different in those two species. So what kind of unites it? it uni what is united here, what unites these two processes is the necessity to bend the tissue, to physically bend it. This is a physical process. And this leads us to a realization that biology fundamentally is nothing else than the expression of physics. Now, this is not a new idea. In fact, these gentlemen here, these Wilhelms, they have defined some 150 years ago a school of thought which is called Entwicklungsmechanik. I recommend to anyone who can read German to read how clearly they understood the relationship between biology and physics. However, they could not do anything about it because they didn't have the tools to study it. Now, we have them. We have now microscopes which are so complex that they actually peer into the complexity of the living system on their own without the human bias. They are using deep learning to understand what they are seeing on their own. And this is crucial because humans see what they want to see. And we have the phylogeny, which, as I said, is the bedrock of biology.
So now it means that now is the time to, to try to understand how evolution exploits physics to create form. Now, in order to do that, what we have to do is to build a bridge between two disciplines, between evolution of development and tissue morphogenesis. This is a little bit more for professional people. They would say, that's maybe not even necessary. Why would you want to build such a bridge? But from personal experience, I know that it is necessary because I am the researcher in the evolution of development field. And what I have been obsessed about is the regulatory level. We, what we are studying is the regulation. And we have done really a lot of work to understand how information transfer, information processing works in living systems across evolution. However, what we do not really think so much about is the mechanism. You know, how does it happen physically? For us, it is a black box. This second research field, they come to the rescue because they actually are all about mechanisms. They have made the largest foray into physics of all of biological sciences, but because they are using extremely complex technologies, microscopy, physical manipulation, they suffer from a strong model organism bias. They stick to those four species, which I showed you in the middle of, of my talk. They will not venture into the diversity of life. So these two fields, if they work together, hand in hand, they can actually make a difference. So I think now it's the time to really combine the conceptual, the experimental, and also the theoretical approaches of evolution of development and tissue morphogenesis, and to study the evolution of morphogenesis. I'm 100% sure that if we look at the diversity across the tree of life, we will discover new morphogenetic processes we did not know about before. By doing this interplay between disciplines, we will be able to systematically connect the gene regulation with the physical mechanisms. Here in Brno, one could also say that we would connect Mendel with Darwin, but it's a little bit cheap to say this. But if we do that, if we manage to do that, we will finally come closer to understand how biology interacts with physics to evolve new, endless forms, most beautiful. Now the question is, where and how can we do that? Well, I uh, had one idea where this could be done, and that is at a place which is called the Janelia Research Campus. This is one of the richest biomedical organizations in the United States. What they have started a couple of years ago is a competition for a new research area, something which they would direct a lot of resources in, $250 million. The competition was very structured. It started with proposals. There were something like 80 of them submitted. 10 of them were selected to come to Janelia in Washington to organize a think tank. We were among them. Three were selected for the final symposium. We were among them. And one of them was supposed to become the new research area. Then, unfortunately, COVID happened, and all that went away. So where, are, where do we stand now? OK, well, I'm, I think. I would like to say for the people who are Star Trek fans that one should never give up, never surrender. Um, we are, I'm trying to forge some alliance of institutions here in Europe. We are talking to Max Planck Society. We are talking to EMBL, which is the mecca of, the, of, of molecular biology inside Europe. And we are trying to wrap into this SATEC also. You might ask, SATEC, OK, why SATEC, why Brno? When you say endless forms, most beautiful, people would suspect that you are referring to the excessive bureaucracy, which is, you know, suff which the scientists here are suffering from quite, quite often, right? But in fact, there is one very good reason, and that is that Brno is the world center of electron microscopy. 35% of electron microscopes are built here in Brno. What does electron microscopy give you? It is the key ingredient to understand evolution of morphogenesis. It doesn't really matter. You don't need to understand what you are looking at here. This is a cross-section for a part of an animal, which is Drosophila. But what you will see is that as we zoom in from that overview of the whole system, we can zoom down to almost molecular and sub-molecular details where we see the inside structures, inside cells, not in dynamics, but in static picture. So that means that part of this vision can actually be realized here in Brno. And we are trying to make that happen by combining the strengths of Brno, which, is, which resides in academia, 
at CETEC, the Material and Life Sciences, and also the Institute of Scientific e Instruments, which have developed some of the first electron microscopes, uh, tabletop electron microscopes in the world. And we try to bridge it with industry, which is really extremely strong here and churns out electron microscopes on a daily, daily basis. And in order to do that, we are asking European Union to actually help us. And let's see how this ends up. So that was all I had prepared for you. I would like to thank you for your attention.